Hello, thank you for joining On Point with Oak Street Funding. Today, our topic is propelling growth to fuel your legacy. First of all, I want to thank David so much. It's a privilege and pleasure to be able to have you today on our podcast. Thank you so much for your time. You're extremely busy, and we're just really grateful for joining us today. We have a lot of listeners and viewers out there that are really interested in learning from you because you have really grown successfully, especially over the last past five years. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but you and I became in contact about five years ago. And at that time, you were at about a billion, uh, a billion point five in assets under management. And now you're way over five billion in assets. You had, um, when we started working together, two offices, Newport Beach, New York City. And now I think you're getting ready to open up your eighth location. Is that correct? Our ninth location. Yeah. Our ninth location. Okay. One slipped in there before I got picked up on it. So congratulations. And and we really appreciate the time today. And I think what we what we want to do is get your viewpoint on how you've been able to grow your business and do the things that you've been doing as far as being on a lot of the different networks, providing market commentary and analysis, as well as turning your um, responsibilities over to other leadership people on your team, and then also giving back, or I should say, helping your community, as well as being a writer. So maybe if you don't mind, share a little bit of background, how you got started with as an advisor in the business. Sure. Well, I appreciate the invite, Susie. Looking forward to this conversation uh, with you and certainly have enjoyed uh, getting to know you and your team over the, um, I guess it's probably been uh, five and a half years plus change now because um, uh, we we began some discussions in, in late 2018 and into 2019. And and like you said, you know, we were uh, somewhere over a billion dollars then, and we just passed six billion um, this last month uh, now. And so it's been it's been a pretty busy uh, five five year period here. But I I began life as an advisor, like a lot of people in the independent channel. Um, I started off in in the wirehouse world, and uh, was a trainee at Payne Weber. Uh, about 25 years ago, and they were quickly bought by UBS. And so what we now know as UBS, uh, their United States wealth management business came about as their uh, because of their acquisition of Payne Weber. And, and so I built up a, a business there as a sole practitioner and, and moved to Morgan Stanley um, uh, about a year and a half before the financial crisis. And and so Morgan Stanley was really where my business grew a great deal and started to build a team um, around myself. And I got through the financial crisis. I actually grew uh, quite quite a bit there from 2007 until 2014. And I became a managing director at the firm. We we had a lot of success, but there was one thing that was abundantly clear to me. And that was that the future of the business was uh, going to be in the RAA channel and for more entrepreneurial type advisors, which, which I considered myself to be, um, you can you can do certain things here and there in trying to build a team at a big firm, but to really have the independence and the autonomy that I desperately craved, um, I needed to to go do that out on my own. And so spent the second half of 2014 preparing, and then in early 2015, uh, made the leap and, and left Morgan Stanley. And so uh, next year, we'll, we'll celebrate 10 years of independence, and, and we have our eyes on becoming a $10 billion firm, and uh, we, we believe that will happen in the next few years here. Well, congratulations. Uh, one thing I want to mention and congratulate you on recently, August 9th, you were on the New York Stock Exchange and got to ring the bell. And it was a celebration because, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you rolled out a new EFT 
um, TVG, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, dividend focus. So that is amazing. So that's another thing that you've been doing here in the last 12 months, besides growing rapidly, um, expanding your team, opening new offices, but also rolling out an EFT. So when we got together and met, you know, over five years ago, um, I think at that time you were buying a book and a lot of the listeners and viewers are always interested in how to grow inorganically. And maybe share with me um, how that transition went and, you know, how did that propel your growth after that as far as buying that book? Yeah, it's an interesting um, deal for us because it's the only transaction like that that we have done. And that was a succession planning case. And actually, as we're sitting here now, the uh, gentleman whose book I bought is in the last couple months until his official retirement. We've we've kept him around on, on a salary for the last year or so. And, and he's just been a wonderful uh, addition to our team. But basically, we bought a sole practitioner, um, a, a small $200 million book that w- was just meant to be a kind of a retirement situation for him and that we were going to incorporate his book into our business. And and we haven't done a lot of inorganic growth. We've looked at a lot of deals, um, but we, because of our organic growth mousetrap, it, it really uh, uses up most of our resources. And yet, as you know, there is a, a lot of inorganic growth opportunity in the industry right now. And indeed, many firms and aggregators that are doing a significant amount in the uh, inorganic and M&A space. That particular deal where, and we did a transaction together around it, um, was really just meant to be a very traditional succession planning case. Use uh, debt capital to acquire um, somebody in their book, spend a few years uh, absorbing that book and getting to know their clients, and then um, as they go off, having other advisors take over that relationship. the That book has long since been distributed for relationship purposes to other different advisors. Um, we, we've kept that practitioner around, still just kind of overseeing a key, a couple key relationships and 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 just generally being available as a, to assist. But, um, you know, it really... Uh, it is an interesting process because I think so much of our focus as an industry is on cultural compatibility with the firms, the team, the people, the advisors, their staff, and making sure that that's all very compatible. And what we learned from that transaction, um, there wasn't a team, there wasn't a brand. It was just a single advisor and, and he's fit in great. And actually, uh, a number of years ago, we ended up hiring his son as well, who has now uh, climbed the ranks through our firm and is the director of our uh, financial planning department. And so a lot of great fringe benefits came out of that. But I do think it taught me that you also have to look to the compatibility of the clients. And I don't ever read about that. And I don't ever hear about that. We hear so much about the compatibility of the professionals involved in a transaction, but because we attract such a unique niche of clients, um, it, it's something that we have to be particularly conscientious of to make sure that the clients uh, fit with with who we are and what we're doing. And that transaction has been successful, but um, the, you know it's the type of thing that helps you kind of learn to, to how you might do it differently in the future. Great information. And that leads into what what we do here at Oak Street Funding. And to your point, it's not just about the buyer and the seller being compatible, and it's a good fit there. But also, like you said, those clients, because I've had situations, I've been lending money to, um, to RIAs and independent advisors for over seven years. And also, I've been lending money for over 35 years to business business owners. And it's it's absolutely got to fit, you mentioned your mousetrap, and that's your secret recipe for success of the Bonson Group growing as well organically like you have. And, and congratulations. And so I know there's, I get a lot of phone calls from advisors that are trying to do what you're doing and um, just taking a step back. 
coming from the wirehouse and being a business owner and running an entire investment advisory firm is not for everyone. And when they independent or advisors are coming out of the wirehouse or be wanting to become independent, have never ran a business. And that is I'm I'm finding out. And that's one reason why we wanted you on this podcast today, because you have been able to hit all those bars. And um it and it obviously it, it's been a great, great ride for you and your team. And we just appreciate learning some of this information. And the one thing about the gentleman that you bought the book from, um, I would say we like as a lender keeping on the seller to help with the transition and the continuity makes that book stickier and more successful. And so there are some lenders out there that really kind of want to push that seller out. So that is that is fantastic. And the one thing that was interesting to me as we have worked together over the years is that you started transitioning your role. And so there's a lot of discussion out there with the advisors out there trying to grow. They can't be all things to all people. You're the managing partner, the founder. You're the chief investment officer for the Bonson Group. But you do all these other things as well. So maybe tell us how you transition and and also finding the right talent to join your firm because you're extraordinary for sure. You even say that on your website. You're exceptional as far as how you provide white glove service to your clients, and it's got to be the right fit. Well, I think that there um, ha- has been a, a lot of evolution in how we, we've addressed this, and, and I don't know that everything we've done has been the right way to do it, but it's worked for us, and and it has to be authentic. It has to fit, you know, the the skill sets, the personalities of the people that we have. Um, I have talked to, to my team and, and my leadership team over the years a great deal about the division of labor that, that we have and uh, different strategies for optimizing how we run our business. And we are have a very strong growth mindset. You know, it used to be that we really wanted to to bring in fifty million dollars a month of new business totally organically. And and we did that for several years in a row. We're very proud of it. And and don't believe there are a lot of uh teams and and companies out there doing that kind of organic growth. But um it's now gotten up to, you know, eighty to a hundred million a month has become our new uh uh aspiration and and we've had two years in a row where we were very, very close to a billion dollars of, of new business brought in. And we believe this year we're going to pass that amount. And so when you're talking about that kind of organic growth, what you know, I think most RAs would love to have that sort of organic growth. But what I've learned is um, all of the growth comes with an ongoing need for more resources within the business. It isn't like I can just feed the top line of, of revenue and more clients and not feed the engine with more fuel, the more advisors, more planners, more operations, more uh, you know investment solutions. Uh, we have a full tax department. We, we do uh, soup to nuts tax preparation and strategy for clients. And so it, it, it leads to a lot more need for the kind of professional management of the business, but I'm an advisor. I grew up on the client side of the business and and I run money. And so to have professional management and client advisory and uh, portfolio management, and then the number one biggest thing is just uh, the kind of feeding of the growth of the business. You know, I'm on television a lot, podcast, writing, uh, written books, weekly commentary. The, this content creation and thought leadership is not for everybody, but it's our secret sauce. And it's the reason we've grown how we have. And, and when we get a lot of incoming leads, inbound leads of people interested in working with us, it's largely as a result of them being attracted to that content platform. So I have to continue feeding that. So those have been four different jobs 
that I've worn. And over the years, we've tried to reallocate my portfolio to some degree. And the biggest thing we did, um, which, which again involved a transaction with you in the bank, was I had about 150 clients I was responsible for day-to-day relationship with. And now that's down to about 25. Um, and, and so we needed to find a way to democratize a lot of that client relationship. I still stay connected. Uh, I'm doing some meeting with a client every single day, uh, sometimes multiple meetings per day. And then I'm also heavily involved with getting on for 15 or 20 minutes with a prospective client of one of our other 20 advisors or helping to close a, uh, an account or, or go visit a client who's already been a client for a bit. But now I'm dropping in for 15 or 20 minutes of a meeting, not running a, an hour and a half or two hour meeting myself. So that's the one area that we were able to create a lot of scale is democratizing the relationship management that maybe pushed that part of my job description from 40 or 50 percent down to 15 or 20 percent and i was able to free that up into more of running the business more you know strategic planning for the business and then that growth engine of content creation writing and speaking it's and being just sort of the brand ambassador of what we're doing that's driven our growth uh pushed up our Hager, our compounded annual growth rate to 29.2 percent per year um, and that's all a byproduct of that content creation and then finally susie the um element that uh, we were able to also provide a little lift to me was on the portfolio management I used to do all the analyst calls myself, all of the idea generation, all the vetting. I might continue to serve as the chief investment officer, but we brought my partner, Brian Seitel, who you know on as a co-CIO. We've hired a couple really first-class, top-shelf equity analysts. Uh, our investment solutions department now across all people is eight or nine uh, members of our team so that CIO work also was able to be aided and abetted with other uh, resources and, and Brian working in that co-CIO role. So I still have my four job descriptions, but two of them we were able to, to lower the allocation and that enabled us to increase the other two and uh, thereby you know, create a more scalable uh, strategy for the future. That's fantastic. As far as finding the right talent for your firm, um, let me ask you, how many employees are you up to now for the Bonson Group? Uh, we are at uh, 70 employees and right now have active searches going on for three new ones. So that's one thing I've given up on is telling myself, oh, we're done hiring for a while. Every time I think that we end up you know, having a, another couple people in a, a quarter that need to come in. So I believe, Susie, when we first met, that we may have been at 20 people, uh, probably 15, but no more than 20, and and we're at 70 uh, full-time people now. Wow, that's that's fantastic. And it's really a, a, a lot of the different conferences I go to and I talk to RIAs and independent advisors are just really finding a hard time finding the right people in the right seats. And... I personally kind of wonder what is going to happen with um, the next generation as far as getting people interested in becoming into the advisory, um, investment advisory world, Um, because, you know, we're going to need that talent for this next next go around for generation. Um, So obviously you've been successful finding people. I think also location kind of helps too. You've got some great locations between Newport Beach, New York City, now West Palm Beach, um, Minnesota, you're in Nashville as well, um, Texas, Arizona. Yeah, um, and then uh, we, we have a satellite office in Bend, Oregon of all places and are getting ready to open in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So Bend and Grand Rapids may not seem like major uh, population centers. They're not the kinds of cities that the big law firms and the big wirehouses go to. And yet 
they're really strong markets for us. And we think Grand Rapids is going to be um, a bigger market for us than Chicago is for a lot of places. Uh, Nashville, wow. Phoenix, Palm Beach, Austin, these have been rapidly growing cities for, for a lot of people. But um, we, we've kind of had a unique um, set of circumstances that have allowed us to grow in different places. But what you were, the point you were kind of making there is really important. And I don't think I've focused on it enough that we really improved our ability to find talent accidentally by becoming a multi-office firm and not having to limit our hiring to Southern California or New York City. Um, there's great talent pool in New York and Southern California, and it can, it could be a bit more expensive. It's higher cost of living, but that's not even the issue as much as just, you know, once you've added Texas, Arizona, Tennessee, you really have increased the pool of candidates you can hire from. And that's been really advantageous for us. Well, with your expansion in all these different markets, is there anything that you want to share as far as like an all hall moment that maybe I wish I would have done things a little bit differently um, than because you obviously have done a lot in the last five years as far as the growth. Um, anything that anything that stood in the way, any concerns or like even positives, like a oh, moment that, wow, this really did work because you have the secret sauce of where you are today. Well, I do think that a lot of aha moments, not just for us and not just in this business, but for any entrepreneurial endeavor, a lot of it is a realization that you maybe couldn't have seen or couldn't have known. But once you do see and once you do know, you have to grab a hold of it. You have to capitalize on it. Really um, take advantage of a certain strength or opportunity that, that comes your way. We, we had a homegrown strength that I was not smart enough to realize was going to be such. And once I did... Um, it became incumbent upon us to really build our strategy around that. And so much in the financial advisory profession, I think, is often people throwing things at a wall and seeing what sticks. And that that may be a really good way to do things for a period of time. I think it's very common. But there is a moment in which you kind of realize what works for you. And I think people are better off going all in on one strategy as opposed to just continuing to try to throw a lot of different things that maybe aren't as authentic, aren't, as, um, you know, you're not building a lot of momentum around them. That, that that in our case, what worked for us is something we decided to really build our whole firm around. You know, the, um, the one area that, that I wish we had more time to devote to um, I, it isn't that I'm looking for inorganic growth, but our sweet spot for hiring advisors is not to hire people with a big book or big rainmakers. And that's what so much of the business is focused on is everybody wants, you know, those people that are really good rainmakers. We feel that we can bring growth to the advisors who work for us. So unlike the industry that might want people who are mediocre advisors, but great rainmakers. We want people who are great advisors that care about clients that ha that are are uh, you know accustomed to being relational and professional. And we are going to provide them the, the business growth that that rainmaking that business development. You know, we kind of have that that mousetrap already in place. Um. My problem is simply that I don't have the ability to go out and resource where those people might be uh, because, you know, if you're going to find one who's a good fit, you're probably going to do 10 or 20 different meetings and, and I don't have the bandwidth for it. So we rely on some of that to, to fall in our laps, but our, our advisors um, are not hired to be uh, rainmakers or, or hired because they already have an incumbent book. We give them the clients, we give them the leads, um, but we we need them to be, you know, philosophically aligned with us and and people who are really to their heart and soul client centric. And that's hard to come by that character, that experience, that professionalism. Um, and yet when you look across our advisors, they may not they may have started in a wirehouse and not had 
a lot of success building a book, but they've been incredibly successful building up a wonderful P&L within our firm. And that's that's something that, you know, is counterintuitive to a lot of people in the business. But that's what I mean by having to really grab a hold of what worked for us. You know, you mentioned Nashville, and that was a big experiment for me. We uh, had no incumbent business. We weren't acquiring anybody. And even the advisor that I hired to start had never been an advisor before, had zero dollars of assets under management. We just went and signed a big lease in a big office, a beautiful downtown building. And the gentleman we hired was, I believe, 29 or 28 years old at the time. He had been a pitcher in Major League Baseball and gotten injured and was sitting at a, as an internal wholesaler and asset manager. Um, I, I got to know him, believed in him, and then we hired operations and hired a planner and some resources around him. One of our equity analysts is out of that office, and we've brought in over $400 million in the first two and a half years out of that office. Uh, wow. And, and so that's the kind of just purely organic growth that is very profitable, uh, very exciting, but also required us to go, you know, make that investment into putting putting our name on the wall and that's what we did. Congratulations. That's that's amazing because I was kind of curious about the Nashville location. So thanks for sharing that. Well, as we get closer to the end of the year, and it's going to be an interesting ride through the end of um, you know, through the election and everything, as far as business owners out there, what three items would you mention as far as they should be thinking about as we wrap up 2024, anything come to mind? Well, I mean, I think that uh, there will be a lot of uh, temptation to be distracted by the election. Um, you know, there's always clients that that want to know where uh, the election is going to impact markets and what should they do and not do. I think most practitioners in the advisory profession, whether it's the election now or another geopolitical event later or economic activity, you know, need to stay very focused. Um, markets have largely been a tailwind, not a headwind for most of the last, uh, you know, post-COVID years, let's call it, you know, four years now. Um, and and yet I do think that the mentality that we need good markets to generate business is completely, totally wrong. Um, we We view challenging markets as a golden opportunity to gather assets. Uh, because we are in constant communication with our clients. We're providing all sorts of perspective and value and commentary and touch and communication all the time. And during bad markets, a lot of advisors are not. And so I think prospecting becomes like shooting fish in a barrel during difficult markets. So who knows what markets will hold between now and the end of the year or, or next year, or what have you. But that opportunity will come. I would encourage people to look at challenges in the market as an opportunity for business development, not a time to have to kind of put the pencil down and, and sit on your hands. Uh, it, we've always viewed it quite uh, with a more contrarian perspective. That's fantastic. Well, to wrap up things, maybe talk a little bit, a little bit different um, aspect for the listeners that are going to be listening to this podcast. You are a very successful writer. Um, I did order your book, Full Time, Work and the Meaning of Life, and I'm planning on taking this on vacation so I can read it and, and concentrate on it. So um, you've written many books, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you dedicated this to your father. I did. And so that book, uh, full time, um, you know, my father passed away in his late forties. I was only 20. And, and so I talk about it in the book, just biographically, um, what his passing meant to the kind of launch of my young adult life and, and ultimately my, my career and, and, and my kind of purpose, you know, here, here in the world. Um, my dad was my hero and my best friend and, so it was nice to be able to write a book uh, that I could dedicate to him that because it was a topic that he had such a profound influence on me. But, you know, I've written um, four books, is he? And only uh, one of them is even indirectly really related to, to markets. I mean, the, my second book, The Case for Dividend Growth Investing, 
um, which is what we do. Uh, we, we've largely uh, developed a strong affinity for dividend growth investing. That's obviously a book that we can use with prospects and clients and that tells the story of what I spent, you know, at the time, 20 years developing a worldview and investing worldview around. But the other books, um, you know, they may peripherally touch the economy, touch the culture, uh, but they're they're more topical books that are related to things I'm passionate about. And there's going to be people that agree with those things. There's going to be people that don't. Some of them may be uh, people interested in being clients and some may not be. But I just sort of came to the realization a number of years ago that that was the way it was going to be anyways. Whether I had gone on television and talked about something or written a book about something, people were either going to like you or not like you, agree with you or not agree with you. I try to present everything as civilly and charitably as I can. Um, I think that's especially important in this particular moment. But that book full time is making a kind of cultural, economic, religious, and yes, um, socio political case for uh, a stronger view of work and a, a stronger existential understanding of how important our work is to who we are as people, to our own identity. And, and it's a topic that I've been passionate about a long time. So, I most certainly would have sent you one. You didn't have to buy it, but I appreciate the uh, title of mine. I'm glad to do it. Yes. And the next time I see you, I'll have you autograph it. <laughs> well, I'd be happy to do it. So it, it, I've been I've been really pleased uh, with the with the response to the book, and and hopefully it'll be a message that encourages some people. Well, thank you for sharing that. Is there anything else you want to share with the viewers and listeners today? We really great you. Greatly appreciate you being on here. Anything else you want to add before we wrap up? Well, no, Susie, I really appreciate the partnership. I, I think that it's been wonderful to to get to know you guys in the bank o over the years. And um, we, we've certainly been able to do a number of things together. And, and it's important to, you know, just like um, you're hiring a, a team of people, but also other technology partners, custodial partners. You know, that's one thing about the world of independence is you have a lot of stakeholders in your business, a lot of people, uh, sure. vendors, suppliers, and, and different uh, elements of strategic partnerships that are very important. And and our case, the banking and lending relationship we have with you guys is one of those. And, and I'm grateful for it. And uh, hopefully some of the, the comments on the podcast today have been helpful. Thank you so much. Well, thank, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for your relationship, and we really appreciate your time today and wishing you the very best for a very successful end of 2024. Thank you, David. Thanks so much. Thank you all for joining today on point with Oak Street Funding, propelling growth to fuel your legacy. We appreciate your time today and joining David Bonson and myself, Susie McEwen, Vice President of Strategic Markets, Oak Street Funding. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.